The pandemic has stretched intensive care capacity in Ontario to its limits. So what happens now if need is greater than what the system can handle? With us on that in the provincial capital, Alison Thompson, Professor of Public Health Ethics in the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, Dalalana School of Public Health and Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. And Ross Upshur, Head of the Division of Clinical Public Health at the University of Toronto and Co-Chair of the World Health Organization's Ethics and COVID-19 Working Group. Both are members of Ontario's Bioethics Table, which drafted an ethical framework for ICU triage in the province. Hello to you both. Good morning. Hello. Um, this is a really difficult um, conversation to have. It's been a tough week here in Ontario, but I'm really happy to have your insights tonight. Um, it is hard to believe that there are over 800 patients in ICUs in Ontario right now, the most ever in the province. Here are some tweets from ICU doctors. This is from Dr. Shandy Ashamala, head of general surgery at Sunnybrook, and he writes, anyone that tells you that we are not rationing and triaging healthcare right now is lying to you period. The second one is from Dr. Barb King, an emergency physician in the GTA, and she writes, unless you have a 70% chance of surviving your intubation, resuscitation, and ICU care, you will be allowed to die. This is coming from Critical Care Services Ontario in the days ahead. We've all been put on notice. Um, Allison, let me start with you. I mean, hearing those words, it just hits you in the gut. And we all remember the tragic stories coming out of Italy at the beginning of the pandemic, where doctors had to make the difficult uh, decision to choose who lived and who died. Are we there right now in Ontario? Well, we're, we're certainly very close. And I think uh, one thing to, to point out about all of this is that Doctors are making decisions all the time about who gets access to the ICU. And so, uh, you know, the, the fact that we're, we're starting to see this rationing is, is just a sort of ramping up because not everybody always has access to, to the ICU, even in the best of times. And so this is just, you know, an exponential sort of uh, growth in, in those decisions that have to be made because there are just not enough uh, resources to go around. And Ross, you know, will this only get worse as we move forward? Well, if we take the model seriously, then we're going to see a continued growth in the number of uh, ill patients requiring hospitalization and that small but predictable tale of people who become severely ill and require critical care. Uh, the, you know, picking up on something that Professor Thompson just said, uh, th the fact is that we do sort of allocation decisions in healthcare all the time and have been doing so for, you know, decades, ever since technology started to emerge as a dominant force in medicine. We've gone through these discussions with uh, organ allocation. Uh, and in fact, everybody who's ever gone to an emergency department in Ontario has been triaged because we use a triage system uh, on urgency to sort out which patients need to be seen at what time. So the idea of allocation or triage is not alien to healthcare thinking. What is really particularly uh, pressing here is the idea that somebody who may otherwise have been eligible for a particular uh, intervention in critical care may be not eligible for it because of the lack of resources. Well, um, you know, you both, both you and Professor Thompson said that dis doctors make these decisions all of the time. We keep hearing this phrase over the past year that we were in exceptional times. Um, Allison, has the government authorized any official guidelines to help doctors make those decisions about who gets to live and who dies? I think what we've seen over the last year is a real reluctance on the part of the Ontario government to engage in a public conversation about this this whole issue and you know they they maybe have endorsed something but but that's not public knowledge i certainly am not aware of that and every time they're asked about that they they just sort of punt it back to either the bioethics table or the critical care command center so it's 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 been a real you know lack of leadership from the government on this i think well, when we talk about leadership, because um, I the government has been in the news all week, um, they're 
leadership has been uh, questioned. Alison, how would you describe the Ontario's uh, government leadership over the last year when we do talk about the critical triage issue? Well, you know, it's very hard for, for us to know exactly what's been going on because there's been a complete lack of transparency about this issue. Uh, the, the work of the bioethics table has has been meaningful and we have been engaging with stakeholders who are most likely to be impacted by these decisions like the disability rights community, uh, racialized communities, uh, and frankly, just people who have poor baseline health who are, and you know, that does correlate to people who are poorer overall. So the, there really has been um, a serious lack of a public discussion about this, and they've just left it up to uh, the, the bioethics table in particular and individual doctors who are working on this triage protocol to do that public engagement themselves. That seems to be a burden, isn't it, Ross? How do you make those decisions if you're not if you don't have the leadership? Well, it leaves people to make decisions unaided and unguided, and it creates a, probably a large amount of moral distress in physicians who are looking for guidance on how to make these uh, decisions. And I do want to pick up on a really important point that uh, Allison just made about the importance of uh, public engagement on these issues, because there's very deep uh, and distinct normative or beliefs about what the right thing to do is in these situations. And I do want to point out that back after SARS-1, in 2003, uh, at the University of Toronto, we convened a group and we were thinking about influenza, but just changed the virus. And we pointed out that we should be anticipating the need to make very difficult resource allocation decisions, including about ventilator capacity. And we strongly urged considerable public engagement in the intra-pandemic period to start to get processes so you could have legitimate decision making. We went through the same process in 2009. There were Globe and Mail head headlines saying, oh my goodness, we're going to be overrun by, vent, you know, by patients and we're not going to have enough ventilator capacity. So it's not just since the uh, you know, emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in 2020 and the experience of it, Italy and New York that was telling us that we needed to think things through. This has been a, a live issue for almost 20 years and it's been completely neglected. Why? Um, because we've been told throughout the pandemic, um, a lot of the lockdown measures, stay at home measures was because we, um, we we were trying not to inundate the hospital system, which is where we are now. Um, so, Alison, why the reluctance to talk about something that we've seen in the in the makings for a while now? Well, you know, I, I will say, you know, that this issue is more than uh, the responsibility of the Ford government. Uh, it, as Ross just said, it goes back decades. Uh, but, um, you know, I think Michael Warren, the critical care physician, put it best when he called this the nuclear football for the government. You know, nobody wants to talk about this publicly because it requires admitting that your ship is going down. You know, we've, we've really got reached a point where things are out of control and these really really stark decisions are going to need to be made and that's not going to look that's not a good look for the government um i'm just going to use unscientific language right now because um w what we're talking about is uh, doctors who are in the business of helping people, but being asked to make the decision of who lives and dies because we don't have um, the resources. That's happening right now, Alison. So how, do we know how those on the front lines are being, in, being instructed to make those difficult decisions right now? Well, the, the emergency standard of care, which was developed uh, you know, without public consultation, um, formal public consultation and without the input of the people most likely to be impacted has not been put into play right now. So, you know, that's the, that's the really uh, algorithmic approach to triage that, that is sort of codifying all the decisions that need to be made when we're allocating bets. But, we, you know, as, as these doctors that you read their tweets out, you know, th this is already happening. I think people are already starting to make decisions about who can get the beds because there just aren't enough. 
Um, if we're not talking, if the public isn't being consulted, and this is something that uh, you've said that the, it's been described as a nuclear football, Ross, what is at stake right now? Well, much is at stake. One is that uh, there's a confusion, not just in the minds of clinicians, but in the minds of the public. And so there's a general but preventable unease about how people feel they may be treated uh, should they uh, have the misfortune of becoming ill enough to require uh, critical care. Uh, so that lack of, again, this goes back to transparency and accountability. It should be very clear uh, to everyone because we're all stakeholders in this. This is one point where it is truly a pandemic. We all have a stake in uh, how our resources are used and how they're deployed. Uh, and we should have uh, clear knowledge, not just me as a physician, but me as a citizen, about what I'm likely to anticipate may happen to me uh, should myself or a loved one uh, arrive in a situation where they might need critical care and may be denied access to that critical care because of some feature of my medical history or uh, uh, qualities of, of uh, prognosis. Uh, everybody should know what the rules of the game are and how these decisions are being made. Uh, there should be no secrecy whatsoever. Uh, these are incredibly difficult decisions and the less transparency there is about it, the more distrust we will have. Uh, and just to uh, build on that, Allison, you recently wrote that the public needed to be involved in the conversation about triage guidelines in the province. Um, why? Well, you know, we live in a democracy and, you know, we we have an obligation to engage with the communities who are who are most likely to be negatively impacted by these decisions. And it's one thing to say that you're just using medical criteria to make these decisions. And while that's absolutely the case, you know, and it's not a deliberate form of discrimination, it is a process of discriminating who is going to benefit the most from the use of ICU beds, right? So, you know, if you look at the consequences of that rationale, even further beyond the ICU, I think we're going to see that it's particular groups of people who are not getting the beds. And, and if we ignore that outcome, uh, which is, you know, it's not the intended outcome, but I think we'll see that it is people with disabilities, racialized communities, people with poor baseline health status with more, more comorbidities who are not going to be prioritized for these beds. So what does that look like? That looks like richer, whiter, healthier people surviving. And we can't ignore that as the ultimate outcome of these rationing decisions. Um, you brought up a few points and we actually have a video. I wanted to show you a clip uh, on one of the points that you made. Um, it's a clip of Miriam Shanuda from Arch Disability Law Center. And this is from a show that we did in January on if these critical triage guidelines discriminate against people with disabilities. Um, Sheldon, if you could please roll. Utilitarianism talks about the maximum benefit of good for the maximum number of people. The problem is that when we look at this, persons with disabilities hardly ever comprise that maximum group of people that have received that benefit. So the ends justifies the means, which pretty much is utilitarianism, will always be discriminatory to persons with disabilities. But if you don't use so that to, philosophy, what yeah, should you use? The human rights framework. Um, you know, when we do talk about individuals, these are individuals, uh, people with families, people with loved ones. And Allison, you know, we're talking about maximum, mass, maximizing lives um, saved and human rights. Can you actually balance those two? That's a, that is the key question. How do we balance the need for an equitable allocation framework with the need to, to save the most lives? And, you know, we can't necessarily accomplish that goal like it has to be a, a trade-off somewhere in there and just to point out that you know if we're allocating beds based on the the notion that we want to save the most lives it's not a foregone conclusion that that will actually happen if you pick uh you know the person with a, the 60 percent chance of of good outcomes versus 40 percent there's still a 40 percent chance that that person's going to die so you know they're these, these are not straightforward calculations that we're making. And I think that most people would be willing to say that it's important that everybody have the same chance to get 
a bed in the ICU, even if that means that your own personal chance may be a little bit lower. Um, and Ross, you know, in this pursuit of the collective goal of maximizing the number of lives saved, will you not end, ha end up in a situation where you are trampling on individual human rights? Well, that's something I think that we need to be extremely careful and mindful of when we're uh, looking at how we implement certain policies. And the other desiderata to have in place is exactly an evaluative framework to see uh, how, what the consequences are of the decisions made. Uh, it's incredibly, it's it, in our research that we did uh, around uh, pandemic influenza, the notion of fairness is extremely important. And in a pandemic, uh, particularly where there's uncertainty, uh, particularly when uh, clinical judgment is relying upon tools of uh, prognosis, uh, that haven't been custom built to the particular situation that we're dealing with, you need to, you know, more fairness is important than less fairness because there's going to be an accounting and a reckoning and, you know, in the Canadian tradition, commissions of inquiry to uh, look at and evaluate how well we have performed and whether we actually upheld the kind of uh, principles and values that are enshrined, for example, in our Charter of Rights and Freedom uh, to the fullest extent possible uh, in the extenuating circumstances that the uh, pandemic placed upon us. So there is um, no formula. Quite clearly, there's no formula for decision about who gets what, uh, but we do need a deliberative space to sort of make a clear decision about how we're going to balance those uh, competing values. In all situations, do you want to, you know, uh, think that people are being fair and everybody is being considered the same? We are in a pandemic. Things are moving very fast. People are very uh, uh, stretched. Uh, physicians are stretched. There's a lot of stress going uh, around. Uh, Ross, do you think um, people in the province could be denied access to life-saving uh, care because of a disability? Well, I would hope not. But again, so disability is a complex uh, concept in and of itself. Uh, and, uh, for example, in a lot of the discussions around using something called the clinical frailty score as a means of helping to sort out. So remember, we're, we're, we're talking about circumstances of extreme need where you have four or five patients and maybe one bed. How are you going to make that differentiation? And so if you look at a lot of the proposed uh, uh, allocation formulas, uh, they look at various clinical characteristics to try to make this differentiation. So you can say discrimination or differentiation. And the reason why disability becomes uh, uh, complex is because it has it's not a, a single one thing. There's a multiplicity of factors that go into uh, whether somebody has a a limitation of function. Some of that might be from a pre-existing condition. Some of that might be imposed by the uh, uh, current uh, uh, condition. Because remember, we're not talking just about people with COVID wanting access or requiring access to critical care, but across the board, all patients uh, from whatever uh, cause uh, that may need to have access to critical care. So is it possible that uh, disability in some form may play a role in clinical informing clinical decision making uh, perhaps uh, and that particularly relates to how uh, the role of what are called uh, activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living uh, function in terms of assessing frailty particularly in older adults uh, because basically if you have a limitation in an instrumental activity of daily living or an activity of daily living such as bathing or, or feeding uh, then you have some form of a disability now would that be but it's part of a gestalt or a complex of other factors uh, that uh, put somebody in that position in the first place uh, um, with respect I'm... to straight out frank discrimination because somebody has a condition that imposes a disability i would certainly hope that that does not occur uh, we we hope that doesn't occur, but I'm I'm guessing people who are watching this or listening to this um, might think that you know that we're in a position where we have to make these grotesque uh, decisions. And uh, Allison, uh, you wrote that making decisions based on calculating a patient's chance of survival uh, quote compounds health inequities by failing to consider social disadvantage. Um, what did you mean by that? 
Well, you know, we've known for decades that it is the, the people who are poorer in society who have worse health. And so, you know, the, the factors that pile up to make you less likely to survive a stay in the ICU start basically from birth, you know, and, and you know, it, the ICU is an incredibly terrible place to be trying to rectify all these social inequities in health that we have. Um, and, you know, it's not a great way to resolve issues around the, the lack of attention to the social determinants of health. But if we ignore that, and we ignore the fact that social disadvantage translates into health disadvantage when you're queuing up for the ICU, I think that we're, we are turning a blind eye to something that is incredibly morally important to take into consideration. And we really haven't had the conversation about how we could maybe be allocating a particular number of beds in the province for people with social disadvantage with some of these um, disabilities that might make them score lower. You know, there's lots of creative solutions out there. You know, we could assign people more points in the triage system because they are from a certain postal code or, you know, we, we haven't had that conversation. And frankly, you know, the, the fact that we've been having um, this protocol created without those voices being part of the conversation is, procedurally from an ethical point of view really not the moral way to do this and i think that you know ultimately um it's a huge burden for doctors to be doing this and it's a you know we need that critical care um expertise to be making these decisions but asking doctors to be the ones who are the primary authors of this kind of a triage protocol is is maybe not appropriate and we've seen supreme court uh decisions uh before or or ontario court decisions which have said that doctors should not be involved in rationing uh resources so you know who ought to be doing this is still a question that isn't resolved um you know we have um just to build on what uh, the professor said we have found out during this pandemic that especially in the gta uh certain postal codes have more cases certain communities have been hit harder by covid and we have these conversations about representation and allison brought up the point of who's at the table when these conversations are being had so ross should decisions about who gets life-saving care take into account these social inequities yes uh, and again, just to pick up and uh, support what was just said by, by Allison, uh, this is something you don't want the burden to fall on. It's not up to clinicians to remediate, uh, you know, centuries actually of knowledge on how structural disadvantage uh, issues like uh, racism, socioeconomic class disability have actually disadvantaged uh, uh, populations. Uh, we can't fix that in the uh, critical care unit, but we did actually have a large interval of time from when we started working on this process a year ago to the present in a situation that we ought not to be in uh, to actually have had that engagement and discussion. It may not have resolved all of the key, uh, you know, deep ethical uh, 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 you know, differences, but it would have certainly have been much more legitimate uh, 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 process by engaging people's decision, uh, th th thoughts on the matter. Uh, we have about 30 seconds, and Allison, I just wanted um, a, you to get uh, a response from you with this question. You've described your role on the bioethics table as window dressing. What did you mean by that? Well, I did say that in uh, the heat of the moment after the uh, the announcement from the Ford government on Friday. So that may have been a bit of an overstatement. There's been a lot of really important work being done, mostly behind the scenes in, uh, in Ontario on some of these issues. Um, but, you know, I think I think what we've seen from the Ford government in the last uh, week or so is a real lack of engagement with the science and with the ethics of, of pandemics. And that's not to say that they haven't listened to some things, but, uh, you know, they, are, they have not been responsive to the evidence all the time, and they have not been very interested in making sure that the decision making goes through an ethical process, which would legitimize the decisions that they're taking.
Well, I want to thank you both for your time. I wish we had more time and um, having this conversation, hopefully it does put that seed in our viewers and people who are listening to start thinking about these things uh, and to consider what might be coming up in the province in the next few weeks. We really do appreciate your time and insights this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.